Hello everyone, welcome back, and in this video we're going to be continuing our study of projections. Previously we had said there are two major ways that we can classify projections. One was by what information is preserved, and we looked at that uh, in the previous video. In this video we're going to be looking at the second way, which is by developable surface. So what is a developable surface? Well, a developable surface is as follows. It is a geometric figure that can be flattened into a plane without distortion. Now remember that what we're trying to get to is a flat plane. We've got this three-dimensional Earth, and we're trying to get to a flat plane. And we said there is no way to take that globe, there's no way to take that uh, 3D sphere and put it onto a two-dimensional surface without distortion. So we've got to go through an intermediary, so to speak. We've got to find a developable surface which is some kind of figure that can be transformed into a plane uh, without distortion. Now there's going to be distortion as we go from the uh, sphere to the developable surface, of course, and that's what causes uh, information, different kinds of information to be distorted or preserved. So for example here, I mean without distorting it or compressing it or stretching it, uh, you can get from the developable surface to a plane. So for example, this cylinder here, you're going to have to think of a lot of this in three dimensions. This cylinder here is a developable surface because if I were to take a cylinder and then I were just to cut it straight up the side, uh, I could unroll that into a plane. So there you go. A cylinder is a developable surface because with this simple cut, I can transform this cylinder into a plane. So a cylinder is one of our developable surfaces. A cone is also a developable surface, and that is because, similarly, I can take some scissors, I can cut uh, up one side of the cone, and then I can unroll it into a plane. I get a slightly different shape here. I get this kind of Pac-Man shape, but you can see that if I make that transformation to the cone, I can get to the plane. It is also true that a plane is a developable surface because well, it can be transformed into a plane without distortion because that's exactly what it is. So the cylinder, the cone, and the plane are three developable surfaces because they can be directly transferred to, or directly converted into a two-dimensional plane. A sphere is not a developable surface. If a sphere could be directly converted into a plane in this way, then we would be set. We wouldn't have to worry about projections because the sphere would be able to be directly transferred into, transformed into a two-dimensional surface, but it can't, so we have to use one of these developable surfaces. Okay, so here's what we've got to do. We've got to come up with some way to systematically transfer information, and the systematic transfer is very important because it is a, uh, ultimately a mathematical equation, so we're going to be doing this in a systematic way. A systematic way to transfer information from a reference globe to a developable surface. The reference globe is the one that we're basically making our map from. Transfer information from a reference globe to a developable surface to convert the developable surface into a plane in order to display the information on a flat sheet of paper or a computer monitor. So here are our steps of making a map, a flat map. You go from a reference globe, which is a sphere, you somehow get that information onto a developable surface and then you convert the developable surface into something flat. So I have some basic representations of what it takes to get information from the reference globe to the developable surface. Here is a cylindrical projection being made. I've just taken a cylinder and I've slid it over the reference globe. So this is a three-dimensional cylinder that's being slid over the sphere. And as you can see, actually this cylinder touches the globe in exactly one place. In this case, it's going right around the equator. So this would be a cylinder that's exactly the same diameter as the globe that just slides right on top of it. And this is how I begin to make a cylindrical projection. The same sort of thing is here with this conic projection. You can definitely think of a cone that I could sit on top of the Earth, kind of wearing the cone like a hat. Uh, and then that is the basic of a conic projection. And then here is my starting point for this planar projection. If I'm trying to create a planar projection, and actually we looked at one of those when we looked at uh, our previous lesson on projections. We were looking at the azimuthal projections that were based on the 
Uh, center point being the North Pole, those were planar projections. This was created in this way. So those are my three ways that I sort of orient the developable surfaces to the reference globe. Well now how am I going to get the data, whatever data happens to be on my reference globe, to the developable surface? Well we conceptualize that by thinking of it actually projecting with a light, okay, projection. So if you think of the reference globe being completely clear, but you've got black lines drawn on it. In this case, I've just got the latitude and longitude drawn in, but you can put whatever information you're trying to map on your reference globe, and it's clear, and then you've drawn in heavy and dark with black all of the lines that you want to put on your map. And then you put a uh, developable surface, in this case a cylinder, around the globe, and then you turn on a light bulb right in the middle of the reference globe you would see, I hope you're seeing this in your minds, and I hope you're visualizing that there would be shadows cast from all of those black lines on the reference globe that would go from the uh, center out and cast those shadows onto the developable surface. So then what I could do is I could take another marker and I could trace all of those shadows that are projected out onto the cylinder. And if I did that, I would be transferring the information from the reference globe in a systematic way onto the developable surface. So you can see that's what's going on right here. Here are the lines of latitude that I just put in blue as they're projecting out onto the cylinder. So here are the lines of latitude projecting onto the cylinder. Here are the lines of longitude projecting onto the cylinder. So that's the kind of distortion. You can really see the distortion that's going on here. You can see that the lines of latitude, it's very easy to see, and the lines of latitude are becoming longer. The lines of latitude get smaller as they go along the surface of the cylinder, uh, excuse me, of the sphere, but when they're projected out onto the cylinder, they have to get uh, as long as the cylinder is in diameter because the cylinder doesn't uh, compress like the sphere does. Then if I were to cut open that cylinder, then I could produce something that looks like this, and I would produce a cylindrical projection. And that's all that there is to it conceptually. And so you can definitely see here again the difference between the graticule. I'm just showing the lines of latitude and longitude, but you can definitely see the distortion between the what's going on on the globe and what's going on on my sheet of paper. You know, you can tell that all of a sudden the North Pole and the South Pole go from being a point to being lines, and this produces uh, or introduces all kinds of distortion into the map. The conic uh, situation is very much the same. If I take a light bulb and I turn it on in the middle, and then you can see where I would be putting all of those lines as they uh, project onto my developable surface. This is a kind of a small cone that's sitting on top, and here are the lines of longitude. I could certainly take another cone and make it much larger and set it all the way around the planet. And you could definitely see then, again, how all of those lines of latitude and longitude are being distorted. But I hope you're really visualizing this in your mind and thinking of this in three dimensions and thinking of the uh, globe with the light on inside of it being projected to the cone. What happens if I were to create the uh, projection here? Well, I'd slice the cone, and then you can see the kinds of thing that I would end up with uh, for my map. So here is a conic projection, and I hope you begin to see how you get there. A lot of these different projections have very characteristic looks. As soon as you look at them, you can tell what type of developable surface was used in order to get there. So with a shape like this, you can definitely tell that it was created from a cone. Here is the same sort of thing going on with the planar projection. I've just got that plane sitting up at the North Pole, like we looked at with another map uh, previously, the light bulb is turned on, and then everything casts a shadow up onto the plane, and then you start tracing out everything that you see on the plane, and you get a, a projection that looks like this over here on the right. And if you recall, or you go back and take a look at the other video, that azimuthal projection that we looked at looks very, very much like that. So you can tell this is the procedure that was used in order to get that. I do want to point out to you the line of tangency. The line of tangency is the line at which the reference globe and the developable surface touch. This becomes an incredibly important line uh, for any map 
because this is the line at which the scale uh, is true. This is the line where the scale of the map is actually true. So all of these different projections have lines of tangency, the line at which the reference globe and the developable surface touch. If I were to wrap this cylinder around the globe, you can see that it would touch that uh, reference globe along the equator all the way around. And therefore the equator, in this particular example, would be the line of tangency. Here is a line of tangency with a conic projection. If I were to make the cone and I would make the reference globe wear it like a little hat, then you could tell that there will be one line all the way around the globe where that cone touches the reference globe. It's at that line on the, referen uh, that line on the map that the scale of the map is calculated and the scale of the map is true. Planar projections, however, have a point of tangency. So if I were to take a plane and attach it to the reference globe in this way, I would just have that plane being tangent to the reference globe in exactly one point. So a planar projection has one point of tangency. Notice that in this example and also in this example, the lines of tangency happen to follow parallels. They happen to follow lines of latitude. And so when that happens, when your line of tangency follows a line of latitude, one of the parallels, we call them standard parallels. These are your standard lines. Your standard parallels are the ones at which scale is constant and actually on that line there happens to be no distortion. On that line there is no distortion uh, between the reference globe and the developable surface because information can be transferred on these lines directly to the reference globe because they're touching. There's no need, there's no space between the reference globe and the developable surface for it to project and to distort. So at the line of tangency, at the standard parallels, if that line of tangency happens to be a line of latitude, there is no distortion. Information is directly transferred. Distortion of all kinds also happens to be least around the standard parallels if the line of tangency happens to fall in a line of latitude. And I think you can definitely see this uh, phenomenon in this uh, conic projection representation here. Do you see the distance that uh, you have between the white lines, which represent the actual lines of latitude and longitude, and then these blue lines, which represent the lines of latitude and longitude as they have been projected onto the cone. Well, notice that as you get to the top of the cone and the bottom of the cone, there's a great uh, distance between the projection and the lines of latitude and longitude on the reference globe. Well, that means there's a whole lot of distortion then in those areas of the map. But notice that there's the least distance around the line of tangency. And that means there's the least amount of distortion in that particular area of the map. Well, that's going to be important here in a moment. So we will look at that again. We will return to that idea in just a moment. I, what I want to do now is introduce you to a few other terms that you may need to know about projections in order to understand what they mean. And the first uh, word I'm going to introduce you to is the word transverse. Here is a transverse cylindrical projection. And transverse just means that I rotate the developable surface 90 degrees from its standard orientation. So notice how I had the cylinder going up and down sort of uh, and touching the equator in the other representation. Well what if I wanted to create a transverse cylindrical projection? All that means is I take the cylinder and I rotate it 90 degrees and then I have a transverse cylindrical projection. And then everything else goes. You can imagine putting in the light bulb in the middle of this and creating a new projection. You would create a transverse cylindrical projection in this instance. The next term I want to introduce you to is oblique. So here is an oblique cylindrical projection. As you can imagine, I could not only stick that cylinder up and down so that it touches the equator, I could also rotate it 90 degrees so it touches the prime meridian in the international date line, but there's nothing that stops you from putting that cylinder around the, the Earth uh, in any way that you want. So you can put it in any other orientation that you want. When you do that, you end up with an oblique cylindrical projection. So just a cylindrical projection means that the cylinder would be touching at the equator. Transverse uh, projection, cylindrical projection, means that the prime meridian and the international date line would be touching the developable surface. If I put it in any other direction, then I have an oblique cylindrical projection. These are all examples of oblique cylindrical projections. They're all in different orientations, and that's no problem. We have a catch-all name for these, which is oblique. You can make oblique 
uh, conic projections as well. You can make uh, transverse conic projections, you can make oblique conic, conic projections. That just means that you're changing up the orientation of the developable surface. Now let me introduce you to another term that refers to the number of lines of tangency that the uh, map may have. In a secant projection, you have two lines of tangency. Here is a secant cylindrical projection. In a secant cylindrical projection, I've shrunk the cylinder, and I've shrunk the cylinder so I can pass it through the reference globe. That's impossible for me to do in the physical world, because uh, you know I've got a sheet of paper or something that is my developable surface, and I've got a globe, and I can't put them through it. Uh, but, you know, I could wrap it around. But mathematically, and of course we are talking about mathematical transformations, mathematically there's no problem with passing the cylinder through the globe. And when I do that, I end up with the, the cylinder intersecting the globe in two different places. And as we had said, the line of tangency where that uh, developable surface and the globe touch, where they are uh, intersect, you have no distortion of any kind. You can directly transfer information from the reference globe to the developable surface, and distortion is minimized around that area, and also that's, that line is where you calculate scale. Well, if one of those lines on your map is good, then if you had two lines like that on your map, it would be twice as good. And so that's a major advantage of a secant projection, because you take, in this case, the cone, and you make it a little bit smaller than your reference globe, and then you pass the, the cylinder through the, or any developable surface, this can be cone as well, you pass it through your reference globe and you end up with two uh, lines of tangency. Now in both of those cases, in both of those lines, scale is true, information is accurately and without distortion transferred to the map, and around those lines the distortion of the map is least. You can do the exact same thing with a cone. You can take a cone and shrink it down, and you can imagine passing the cone through the reference globe so that it uh, touches, it intersects the globe at two different places. You would have a secant uh, conic projection as well. What happens if you make a secant planar projection? Well, instead of having that plane touch the Earth at one point, you can imagine pushing the plane down through the reference globe and a secant planar projection ends up having an entire line of tangency uh, because you've pushed it down through the globe. Okay, so now when we name projections, we give them names like this, like this oblique secant conformal conic. What I want you to do is to find out what that must mean. If I said I have a oblique secant conformal conic projection, what does that mean? Go through each one of these different words here and figure out what it means for something to be oblique, what it means for the projection to be secant, what does it mean for the projection to be conformal, and what does it mean for the projection to be conic. And that actually tells you a tremendous amount about what kind of information this projection is going to preserve and also how this particular kind of projection is constructed. This is very important information because you see projections written out this way uh, all the time. And if you understand what all the words mean, you can know a lot about projections. All right, well, that wraps up this brief section in projections. I suppose I'll see you in the next lesson.